This episode is brought to you by Google. Google's two-step verification was built to secure your account and help prevent cyber attacks, even if your password is compromised. That's why Google has made it easy to sign into your account with this additional layer of protection. Just one tap and you're in. Learn more at safety.google. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 104, Chartwell. Last time, Churchill had just released the first volume of The World Crisis. His advance was a staggering 3,000 pounds. The family's well-being was secured for the immediate future, except that just after five weeks of being handed this check, Winston used all but 50 pounds of it to buy himself a Rolls Royce. The family, it seemed to Clementine, was back to square one. But Winston felt confident in his financial future, and subsequent events supported this belief. After all, in Britain alone, his multi-volume work of the Great War sold more than 80,000 copies. The remuneration to the head of the Churchill House added just over 58,000 pounds, or just shy of $286,000, to his coffers. So, it was with a bit more courage that Winston looked his wife in the eye when telling her of his latest gambling losses, or the reason for any other monies leaving their collective pockets through his actions. His attitude? There was more where that came from. Still, it's a brave man that makes a major purchase without consulting the missus. The largest purchase of them all is, of course, a house, and no man in his right mind except Winston, would ever undertake such a life-altering decision alone. During the first two years of the 1920s, the Churchills had moved in with a cousin of Winston's at 2 Sussex Square to share the costs. But in 1922, another cousin of Churchill's, once removed and a bachelor, died in a train accident. Winston suddenly found himself with an inheritance of several thousand pounds. And, as he had always wanted a country home, it was time to engage a real estate agent. But the impatient Winston couldn't or wouldn't wait, so he started driving through the wooded lands surrounding London. Before too long, he came upon a house with 80 acres near Westerman, in Kent, about 25 miles from London. It liked him very much. Its location of paramount importance fit the bill. But the house, well, was anything but pleasing to the eye. Its red brick structure, built during the time of Henry VII, had gone to seed during the 1800s. Also, the previous owners, deciding that they were masters of architecture, but really not, added on ponderous bays, two hideous wings, and then covered it all up with various plants and bushes. Yet the overall effect was ugly. But it was the view from the ugly house that captured Winston's heart. When looking out, he could see meadows, green slopes, and gentle woods. Nourished by a spring, the chart well. Winston later wrote, quote, I bought chart well for that view, unquote. And as the saying goes, in for a penny, in for a pound. And Winston's penny came in the form of seriously looking for a place without Clementine, who was in Scotland at the time, taking care of her sick grandmother. The pound came soon after, when he took the children to see Chartwell, telling the delighted kids that he was considering buying the place. I think the phrase co-conspirators applies here. The children, being children, loved it, of course, being something different and so vast, which must have tipped the scale in Winston's mind. So, he began negotiations. However, things didn't go his way at first. So, he thundered about the cost to him of repairing Chardwell, but only managed to talk the sellers down by 500 pounds. Then Winston, being Winston, handed over the 5,000 pounds agreed to, and then put the disgraceful episode behind him. It was time to remake his Camelot. 
To know Winston's first two years at Chartwell is to know the man, if only because he put so much of himself into the home and its environs. This was mostly because a long-held dream of his was coming true, to be the lord of a country estate. But more importantly, because the missus, who wasn't consulted, didn't like it. Really didn't like it. When the lady of the manor entered the grounds for the first time, she saw what Winston saw. But her eyes were focused not on its potential, but its detractions. Clementine glared at the rot. She frowned when it was determined that the entire structure had to be reworked from the ground up. She grimaced upon concluding that, clearly, an altogether new wing was needed if she was to have a space of her own, as well as a proper dining room. But indeed, the view was nice. Yes, Clementine was equally captivated, but by the cost of making Chartwell livable. And she was right, of course. By the time they were nearly done, around 20,000 pounds had gone into it. Churchill defended himself by saying, This wasn't a waste. It was an investment. They would live here for many years and then hand it over to Randolph. Its value would only grow. So, as the cozy pig, yes, the house got a nickname too, was being repaired, the family rented a nearby home. Winston took it as a good sign when he found out that the Hosey Rig, their temporary residence, was where Lewis Carroll had written Alice in Wonderland. Don't let the irony escape you. But now was the time for Churchill to make Chartwell, well, livable, by his leadership and by his own sweat. And as Churchill seemed to do everything, he jumped into it with both feet. Asparagus was planted, strawberries, fruit trees, and a water garden for Clementine. Swans glided over the lake, created by a dam, put in long ago. Why only one dam? asked Winston, seeing it as a natural question. Equally natural, to him, was the answer. Soon, two more dams were in place, along with the accompanying lakes. However, one of them would not survive. The man, for all his lofty thoughts, for all the books he had read, written, and memorized, was in his element with getting his hands filthy. He laid bricks. He built, by his own labor, two colleges, a few walls that still stand today, and a playhouse for Mary the Mouse. But the money had to be kept flowing in, as it was most assuredly flowing out. Soon Winston reached a balance, as he told Baldwin, Quote, 200 bricks and 2,000 words a day, unquote. Then there is the long, drawn-out, pain-filled, and ultimately failing episode where Winston, again trying to bring his wife over to loving the place, tried to make Chartwell self-sustaining. Soon there were ducks, chickens, geese, cygnets, and lambs roaming the land. But each one of them soon had a name, given to them by the lord of the manor. And once an animal had a name, it was spared the blade. Quote, the beast will not be deprived, not while I'm alive, unquote. And yes, there is an exclamation point in that quote. When Mary's dog became ill, Winston's own grief more than matched the child's. But this was no way to run a farm. And in one instance, Clementine got her husband to sacrifice a goose for the dinner table. When the time came to serve up the prepared bird, Winston, hesitating with the knife, said, quote, You carve him, Clemmy. He was a friend of mine. Unquote. Of course, there is an exception to everything, and Chartwell was no exception. Running around the grounds was a ram named Charmaine, who seemed to wait until Winston's back was turned, and then butted the children, who went crying to father. He scoffed at their protests, then personally vouched for the animal's good character. But then came the day, and the children remembered this day gleefully for the rest of their lives, when Charmaine got behind the master and charged into him, striking him just behind the knees. Down went Winston, master of Chartwell. But before the sun sank, down too went Charmaine, never 
to be seen again. Indeed, the home had Winston's heart. To prove this, after Clemmy was hit by a bus and forced into bed for six weeks in Venice, do doctors still make prescriptions like that anymore? She asked Winston to join her. But the husband not only said no, he put it like this, quote, Every day away from Chartwell is a day wasted. Every minute of my day here passes delightfully, unquote. It's amazing to me that he was still around in 1940 to lead his country in war. But if Winston was the dense rock, Clementine was the water running over it. She was stuck with the place and knew it, but in time put her own imprint on their home. She had learned long ago not to try and debate her quick-witted husband, but instead to let certain things run their course like Charmaine, and then moved in with words of understanding and a suggested course of action. No man, even Winston, was, is, or will be truly the king of his castle. Getting back to politics, the government of McDonald's Labor Party and Asquith's Liberals almost made it a whole year. MacDonald, sympathetic to the communists in Russia, supported Lenin's party, even loaning it money. But he then went too far for Asquith's taste. When the Prime Minister dropped charges against a communist editor who encouraged mutiny among British soldiers, that was too much. Asquith withdrew his support, and Labour lost a vote of confidence, 364 to 198, which meant another general election. As concerning the hero of our story, Churchill decided his time had come and stood for the election in October of 1924 as the conservative candidate for Epping. And finally, Winston was back in the House. Just to put Churchill's political history into perspective, this seat would be held by him for the rest of his political life. However, in 1945, as the boundary was changed, it would, from then on, be called the Woodford Constituency. Hi, this is Nathaniel Lloyd, host of the podcast about historical myths and misconceptions, Historical Blindness. I'm here to tell you that maybe you've already earned that fun you keep putting off, thinking you don't quite deserve it yet. Maybe fun should be on your to-do list and not at the bottom of it, since we never seem to reach the end of those lists these days. Prioritize yourself and add some diversion and enjoyment to your daily routine with Best Fiends, the puzzle adventure game you can play anytime, anywhere. I'm on level 145 and I can tell you, it's so easy to pick up and play between tasks, even if you've only got a few minutes free. You can play offline, even when you're out and about with no Wi-Fi, and you'll always find new fiends to collect and new levels to beat, and seasonal challenges too, like the ongoing Season of Seas, in which you can earn rewards by completing tasks. You've earned your fun time. Now go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best fiends. Having gained a seat in the house, letters of congratulations began to arrive. Then, letters expressing hope that the conservatives would realize what they had in Winston and offer him a cabinet position. But Winston could not see this happening. The Tory majority in the house was much too large to use up a valuable space for someone most Tories still questioned. But to Winston's rare delight at being wrong, he misread Baldwin. The Prime Minister needed to separate Winston from Lloyd George, who was still vying for a way back to number 10. And what better way than to tie the colorful but brilliant M.P. Churchill to the P.M. MacDonald, then with a promotion? But to what position should Winston be placed? and how to make it palatable to the Tory majority. Both riddles were unraveled, surprisingly, by a new player in the game, the 49-year-old Neville Chamberlain, half-brother of Austin Chamberlain. He had just turned down the Chancellor of the Exchequer 
instead wanting the Ministry of Health, and suggested in his stead, Winston. Baldwin replied that his colleagues would howl, to which Neville replied, yes, but they would howl all the more if Winston was given the Admiralty again. And so Baldwin invited Winston to 10 Downing Street and asked him to be the Chancellor. Winston looked at the Prime Minister with eyes hardening and replied, of the duchy, referring to the weakest position within the cabinet and one previously held by him. No, said Baldwin, of the exchequer. Winston paused, bit back an untoward thought, and calmly said, quote, This fulfills my ambition. I still have my father's robes as chancellor. I shall be proud to serve you in this splendid office. Unquote. After another pause, he added, You have done more for me than Lloyd George ever did. As the Chancellor of the Exchequer was second only to the Prime Minister, and Clementine truly believed their next home would be at number 10, the Churchills moved into number 11 Downing Street and sold their home at Sussex Square. Taking office on November 13, 1924, Winston was determined to wrap his brain around the concepts of high finance. He mostly succeeded. Sometimes he understood how the empire's financials were all connected. Sometimes, when discussing options with bona fide economists, Winston thought, after a while, these fellows start talking Persian, and then I am sunk. Just as when he became the colonial secretary, Winston walked into an ever-increasing series of problems that would have bowled over the best of Britain's financially knowledgeable politicians. First, there was the ever-increasing unemployment tied to the second major problem, the decreased demand of British goods as markets abroad sought cheaper products. But the 400-pound, weight, not currency, gorilla in the room was Britain's war debt to the United States. At the time, it was $4,933,701,642, and this was 89 years ago. Interest alone was £35 million a year. And, try as he might, Winston could not get the U.S. government, through its officials, to understand that, until France paid back their loans to Britain, the U.K. couldn't afford to pay the U.S. Frustrated beyond belief, Winston wrote to Clementine on January 10, 1925, quote, I have had tremendous battles with the Yanks and have beaten them down inch by inch to a reasonable figure. In the end, we are fighting over tripe, like 100,000 pounds, unquote. But now it was time for the real work. April 28, 1925, was Budget Day in the House of Commons, really the most important day for the Chancellor of the Exchequer, as he, or she, explains the government's policies and priorities by explaining, namely, where the money is going. So, as Winston began, the members of the House sat back and relaxed, knowing they were in for a show from this most remarkable of speakers. And the man did not disappoint. The speech was two and a half hours long, but Winston held them in thrall. He was witty, engaging, and explained things so that, quite frankly, someone of his own limited understanding could grasp the government's plans. At one point in the speech, Winston poured himself a small glass of whiskey, then said, It is imperative that I should fortify the revenue, and I shall now with the permission of the commons, proceed to do so. He then emptied the glass. Only later would the chuckling Tories realize the details of Winston's speech. He was taking the conservatives to the compassionate edge of their political philosophy. As he believed that the answer to the country's woes was productivity, it was his job to give the people the tools they needed to inspire more production. As he viewed those who did not need to work as, quote, the glittering scum of the deep river of production, unquote, their taxes should be raised, while those on the other end of the economic spectrum be lowered. He proposed to reduce the qualifying age of pensioners. It was no one's business why these people needed assistance. The point was, they needed help, not blame. 
Also, those that needed health insurance the most, quote, the stragglers, the exhausted, the weak, the wounded, the veterans, the widows, and orphans, unquote, would have it. But where would this money come from, for all this good? Ah, that was the rub. First, ten million pounds would be cut from the budget, mostly at the expense of the Admiralty, which upset, and that's putting it mildly, many of those that still revered the former Sea Lord's name. The second way was by putting Britain back on the gold standard, which in the long run was not a good idea. Later, when challenged by the current First Sea Lord, David Beatty, a longtime friend, as to the government's plans, Winston replied that the day of the battleship was over. It was now the time of the airplane, specifically the torpedo airplane, and any craft that could carry it. As Winston held the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer for the next five years, each branch of the military saw their budgets cut. That is, except for the Royal Air Force. After all, Churchill and many others continued to espouse the idea of the Ten-Year Rule, in that they could not imagine Britain being engaged in a large European war for the foreseeable future. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, you're probably totally surprised to get the second episode in the same day. Uh, turns out the wife took the kids and went to go visit some family, and instead of just laying around or doing some yard work, I dedicated the entire day to you. Wrote, edited, recorded, edited, and got this episode out all on the same day. So, hope you hope you enjoyed it. So, I between this morning when I put out episode 103 and now that I'm putting out episode 104, I get two new members. So, I'd like to say hello and welcome aboard to Dermont K. from Suffolk, Virginia. Hello, Dermont. I'm waving hi to you, but you probably can't see it. Anyway, and then there's Mike's, Mike S. from Mansfield, Australia. So, thank you both very much for supporting the podcast. Hope you enjoy the membership episodes. I think there are 31 of them now. And again, for everybody, please make sure you send me your um, entry into the contest. I'm going to be giving away five Churchill mugs when I finish the uh, Churchill series. Almost there. Uh, and no, there won't be another episode put out tomorrow because I'm going to get some sleep now. Just don't forget to send me your email to wwiipodcast at gmail.com. Please put contest into the subject. And good luck to everyone. Take care, everyone. <laughs>